Good morning. Today we are going to be continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount by looking at the second antithesis. Last week we looked at the first one, which deals with the sixth commandment, which is do not murder. This week we will look at the second antithesis, which deals with the seventh commandment, which is do not commit adultery. Remember we're in the section of the six antitheses where Jesus is giving example to us, to his, us as the, his disciples of how he handles the Old Testament ethical material. In other words, how he is going to go about fulfilling the law, especially against his opponents, who too were the experts of the law at the time, that Jesus actually focuses on the spirit and intent of the law, while his opponents, the Pharisees and the scribes, focus on the lettering of the law. Let's dive into the text. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. This is the word of the Lord. Well, the, the interpretation of this passage this morning and the vocabulary is very, very straightforward. But of course, the application is not at all. It is difficult. So why don't we now apply the method that we used last week? exactly the same to this particular antithesis. All right, we start with the law itself. That's uh, step one, which is this circle, this hard boundary, which is no adultery. So in other words, stay inside this boundary. That's what the law is telling us to do. However, Jesus says, well, this is not enough. So why don't we look at the intent of the law, which is stop lust. Okay, this negative um, sexual desire. And he is targeting the men. That's very clear in the passage here. If you look at a woman, usually here a married woman, that's what the text is suggesting. Okay, so it's, this passage is being directed to, towards men who have a particular weakness in this area. Three, what's, I'm going to add a fourth category. So we're looking at now the meaning of it in three and four. So what's the meaning of it? In other words, why? Well, if you violate this ethical principle, what you're doing, Jesus is saying, that you might end up in hell. So you are jeopardizing your salvation. That's why you want to avoid crossing this boundary and to lust. So why? It is actually for survival. And we're talking about eternal salvation. And finally, for how? The meaning of it, Jesus says, you can see from this uh, teaching, be very, deal with, deal with sin drastically. That's how. Deal with sin drastically. Now I want to clarify, uh, this came up in our small group last week. Um, one of the persons was asking, you know, how come the reasoning, like the the meaning of it, Jesus is focusing on, like, again, it was actually to avoid hell again. So this seems rather narrow in meaning. And it is, because Jesus is actually giving one particular example. So in fact, uh, so let me digress for a moment, that this is not the only direction Jesus could have taken it, right? So he could have taken it in another direction, let's say to prime, that the intent could have been you know, the law of no adultery, it is actually to protect marriage, the sanctity of marriage. That's another possible intent, right? And then three prime, why? Well, 
it is actually to protect the relationships, right? The family. Protect relationships in the family, meaning the spouse and children. And that would be a far more positive intent instead of stopping lust, right? This is more a negative approach. But nonetheless, uh, the complexity of laws and ethical uh, principles. But here, in today, in this teaching, Jesus is focusing squarely on curbing lust and dealing with these issues of heart desires, right? Very strong, obviously, heart desires, right? I mean, like in men, and I'm sure that there are other very strong heart desires motivating us, which then lead us to into, get, get us into trouble. Okay, so uh, as in last week, we want to now summarize what Jesus is teaching in the way of a principle. Last week, it was for the law of no murder is do no harm. That's the principle from the first antithesis. The second antithesis, what is the principle? Well, it is do harm. Well, I put that in, well, it has to go in quotation. We have to qualify what that means. Do harm. In what sense? Well, take drastic measures in dealing with sin in my life, aiming at the heart. Well, why the heart? Well, that's the root of the problem. The principle for this week in the second antithesis, do harm. Take drastic measures in dealing with sin in my life, aiming at my own heart, which is the root of the problem. In recent years, there's this uh, movement in, in, the, in Christianity that people are taking more of an interest in their spiritual walk, going on like um, these spiritual discipline seminars and really you know, weekends away, try to focus on prayer and stuff like that. And that's really good. However, today in this passage this morning, you know, we might do all these rather pleasant and cool and fashionable things of spiritual disciplines and completely avoid the core issue. This morning in this particular teaching in the Sermon on the Mount actually gives from Jesus, the Lord Jesus himself, the fundamental pillar of spiritual disciplines. And let me tell you, it's anything but pleasant and cool and nice. It's ugly. It's talking about chopping off limbs and, you know, gouging out, out eyes. It's ugly, it's offensive, and it's drastic. But don't miss this point. From this particular teaching, we see actually in all the parts of the New Testament that it forms the pillar of Jesus' version of spiritual discipline. In other words, how we are going to change as New Testament people, as kingdom people. So that means that you can't just do all these pleasant things and then avoid the pillar of what Jesus is getting at. If you want change, if you want true, lasting change and salvation, then pay attention to these words this morning. They are unpleasant, costly, difficult. It is Jesus' own program of spiritual formation of spiritual disciplines. Now let me prove it to you from scripture. We're going to find this pillar, so-called pillar of spiritual disciplines from Jesus' own teaching. And so we must start with Matthew chapter 15. Recall the context that uh, his opponents were offended that, you know, maybe his disciples weren't washing his hands, you know, before they're eating. And this is Jesus' teaching, 1519, Matthew. For out of the heart 
comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unclean, not eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. So I hope that you are completely familiar with this passage. What we see here in Jesus' ethical approach and spiritual discipline approach is that he's going to aim directly at the heart, the heart of the human problem. So the outward stuff that we do in the way of immorality, um, adultery, slander, and stuff like that, the origins of it, Jesus said, comes out of the heart. That's the problem. There's something deep and evil being sown in the human heart. And in order to deal with the problem, to, true, to have true transformation, you got to aim at the heart. In other words, we need heart surgery and heart chemotherapy. Let's look at the second passage. This is a more general passage than ours this morning. It does not concern adultery. It, it concerns actually sinfulness in general. Okay, so it shows that Jesus' teaching regarding this drasticness of dealing with sin is more than about adultery. Matthew chapter 18, verse 7. Woe to the world because of these things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands and two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into the fire of hell. Again, the takeaway here, it's almost exactly the same as the, as the antithesis we covered this morning. But here it's applied to general sins all manner of sins. So you cannot say then, by looking at our passage this morning, that Jesus is only referring to a, adultery and lust, this drasticness. Actually, it's supposed to apply because of the exactly identical teaching to all areas of our life which causes sin. And therefore, by looking at these two passages from Matthew, the same gospel, we see that this is actually not a particular way of dealing with sin. It's actually a general way of dealing with sin from Jesus. Therefore, I call it the pillar of Jesus' own method of spiritual disciplines, okay? Beyond like, you know, having a chat at Starbucks. And do not think that it is limited to the Lord Jesus himself, because let's look at what his disciples write about this. In particular, in this case, Paul, being an exceptional student of Jesus, I think he's working off directly of Jesus' teaching on like Sermon on the Mount and in Matthew passage we just read. Okay, Colossians chapter 3. I'm just going to skip forward a little bit here to verse 5. Paul says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature actually, literally, flesh, sin, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, there you go, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourself of all these such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self and its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. So here we have uh, Paul being a student of Jesus, exactly the same teaching. 
Verse 5, put to death, chop it off, what belongs to our earthly nature, our flesh. All these lists and categories of sinful behavior. So therefore, so therefore from the Lord, as I'm suggesting to you, and from Paul and others, we can see that this is actually this morning describing a general approach of spiritual disciplines as followers of Jesus and how we change and how we deal with sins in our life. Remember, heart change that leads to behavioral change. I need to make a couple of comments here before we go forward. Let me make two comments, very important one. First, the teaching here about chopping off limbs and gouging out eyes is, of course, right, it's a hyperbole. It's exaggeration in Jewish fashion. So it's never meant to be taken literally that you don't go chop off a hand and gouge out an eye, right, in dealing with sin. You might find this a little bit weird because uh, that actually happened in the history of the church. People actually mutilated their bodies. But what Jesus is getting at here is not literal. What he's dealing with, if your hand causes you to steal and you cut it off, right, it doesn't deal with the issue of greed, right, in our hearts. What Jesus is aiming for, again, is dealing with sin in our hearts so that we deal with the root of the problem. Second of all, this teaching is not fully developed here in Sermon on the Mount or in Matthew, the Matthew chapter 19 earlier that we read. He sets the basic premise of his spiritual method or discipline of how to deal with sin. So, of course, drastically and aggressively. However, it will require going on the other side of the cross, really, to deal with the fullness of what Jesus is getting at. So people like Paul and other New Testament writers is going to fill in the rest of it. While Jesus lays the foundation of the spirit of it, which is this drasticness of dealing with sin and rooting out heart problems. It's the New Testament writers then from the other side of the cross that talks about um, forgiveness of the cross. It talks about the gift of the new life. It talks about the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it is with these blessings then that we're able to deal with sin drastically in our lives. So the second qualification is very important is that we don't read this passage in mistakenly thinking that we can achieve this on our own. We're talking about heart problems here. You know, if a problem a problem has this issue with lust, it's, it's not simply that, bam, you know, I can just get rid of it. It requires actually the full resource of the New Testament people from the other side of the cross, the Holy Spirit, forgiveness and the new birth in order for us to truly put these things to death. And therefore, if you try to do it on, on your own, you will surely fail. Of course, then I want to point you back to the Beatitudes once more, that Jesus is already hinting of this grace that is coming after he dies and resurrects. Remember, the Beatitudes have this pattern of lack and then being filled. The lack here is our, our sinful desires and so forth. And, you know, even struggling with it and, and failing and not being able to overcome it. However, as we acknowledge and as we ask God, we will be filled in the last four Beatitudes with the grace. Remember, blessed are the pure in heart. That God will even give us the resource to deal with very serious and deep heart issues. To purify our hearts. To support more my point more fully, I want to return to the passage in Colossians we just read, put to death these things and so forth. Notice that just preceding it, how Colossians 3 starts are with these words from Paul. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, 
where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You're getting this, right? The only way that we can put to death in verse 5 these heart, these bad behavior that springs out from our hearts of immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and so forth, is if we have been raised with Christ, the new birth, standing on the side of Jesus' death on, and resurrection, where Jesus is now exalted, seated at the right hand of the Father, and has sent us the Holy Spirit that enables us to live a new life. For we die to the old life, and your new life is now hidden in Christ. So don't miss this point, brothers and sisters. Because many have attempted to read Sermon on the Mount without this reality of the new life and the grace that was totally hinted at and described in the Beatitudes. Okay, if God does not fill us, we merely remain in our unrighteousness and, and, the, and the bondage of the old life. So all this discussion of drasticness and dealing with sin is premised on the new life of what Christ did for us. All right, I just want to finish off this message this morning in the way of talking about application. Did you hear the story about this uh, mountain climber? So he's American, and what happened is that he was in Utah somewhere and climbing by himself. And then as he was making his descent, he got his right wrist caught. He dislodged a boulder and got his right hand caught and pinned uh, to the canyon wall so he cannot he cannot move because his 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 uh wrist or his arm is pinned uh, by the boulder and so they even made a movie about this how he survived was actually to take a dull a dull pocket knife and actually to cut off his own arm and therefore releasing himself and then you know and then climbing down and walking to safety Every, every, I don't, I'm not going to watch this movie, right? Because even hearing the description of it, it's like, it, you know, if you empathize with him, right? It's basically every time you hear this thing, there's this, you know, this expression is like, you know, so in English, we call this reaction, right? The cringe factor. We're cringing. It's like, you know, uh, eating a really sour lemon. It's so unpleasant, right? The situation. He had to like chop off his own arm with a dull, you know, pocket knife, right? So there's a sense of agony, of pain. It's it's ugly and it's offensive. If you read this passage morning and you are cringing, then you are reading Jesus' teaching correctly, much like this mountain climber had to chop off his arm. So it's supposed to invoke in us cringe. I call it the cringe factor so in the way of application what jesus is teaching is that first point in the way that we deal with sin often we have to cringe because if we're going to deal with these issues in our lives that actually harm people and ourselves then it is going to be three things it's going to be very costly and it's going to be very ugly and it's going to be very offensive it's going to be very costly, ugly, and offensive. That's the first point. The second point is this, regarding the cringe factor. You know, we don't like cringing, right? Like, do you like eating lemons or something? But, you know, and certainly not chopping off a limb, right? Something that near and dear to us. So, in Jesus' teaching this morning, the second thing we want to recognize is that it is a not a normal reaction. Therefore, just as this hiker 
climber saw the desperation of his situation, he had two choices. Either he, he, he lets his arm be pinned to the canyon wall, or that he can take drastic, ugly, offensive measure, which is to cut off his own arm and survive. This is certainly not normal behavior. You with me? So in dealing with sin in our life, Jesus says, this is for us going to be not normal behavior. Our reflex is either to ignore it, to deny it, to blame it on somebody else, and also to focus on other people's sins, right? You know, that judgment thing that's coming in chapter 7. But the last thing we want to do is to look into our own lives and not only just to make light of the things we do, but to get right in there into the heart of the matter and to get heart surgery on the behavior, on the desire that causes that behavior to harm others, God and myself. Not normal behavior. And yet this teaching this morning is challenging us that while it is not normal, it is crucial to our survival. That's the offense of it. Let me illustrate. Some years ago, uh, before I was even the pastor, um, a brother and I, a brother in Christ, and uh, and I was helping someone get off heroin. He wanted to come. F- become free of his addiction. It's a, it's a friend of mine. So we spent a weekend of him to detox off of heroin. And I tell you, this is the picture of dealing with deep sin and heart problem in our lives. What happens when people get off heroin, when they're addicted to it? Well, they do everything they can to resist. So it sounded a good idea at the time when he wanted to get off drugs. But once the withdrawal symptom comes, then he is, he said, no, I'm not doing this anymore. No, no. He said, give me my keys. He said, what do you, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll manipulate us. He'll try to be angry with us. And our singular job as his friends is actually to resist him this person getting off drugs for this person is so painful to first of all ask for help it is embarrassing he he has to give up his rights he has to give us his wallet and his keys uh, he told us at the beginning don't listen to me when i when i'm trying to manipulate you or get angry no matter what don't listen to me you getting you getting this that's how it is. Often that as we're dealing with deep sin in our lives, we're slave to that sin. We, it's not normal behavior. We, won't, we don't want to deal with it drastically. We want to make light of it and somehow escape that painful process. The costliness of it, the offensiveness of it, and the ugliness of it. Not all sins are equal. You know, and the stuff that in our hearts that causes these behavior. So, Sometimes there are the surface sins and that we can, through our new life, quickly put these things to death, as in Colossians. But there are other deeper sins which require greater care, uh, more time, more work of the Holy Spirit in transforming us. And these usually have to do with the deep things in how we grew up in our families or hurts or trauma that we have sustained in our lives. But the New Testament actually doesn't make a lot of distinction between these two types of sins. It just assumes that Jesus has given us the resource or will give us the resource in order to root out these behavior in our lives. It never, you know, gives a lot of apology explanation. It just assumes that he has the power and the grace for us to change. So our job then is to look at that sinful behavior and see the desperation of it and see that it's jeopardizing our relationship with God, with others, and even our own salvation, and to deal with with 
utter ruthlessness and no mercy to do harm to these sins and root it out at the basic level of our heart's desire in our lives. So this is the teaching this morning. The first antithesis, the principle, is do no harm. The second principle in the, in the second be antithesis is this, do harm. Be utterly drastic and ruthless in dealing with sin in our lives, aiming right at the heart and the cause of those sins. Amen.